Happy Sunday, folks. Yay! Yay! Real quick, I need a show of hands if you were under 21. All right, that just means I have to have a filter. Cool. Not necessarily. Under 21s, are you also over 18? Or 18 and over? Are you under Are you a minor? No. Okay. Are you one gentleman in the black shirt? Are you under eight? Not in the black shirt. Yeah. Okay, you're cool. <laughs> so I can Sasha just wants to know if he needs to filter his language. Can we cuss? That's what I'm saying, yeah. Fuck yeah. Okay, <laughs> she did it, so... Y'all heard it here. Well, whether we can or not, I'm probably going to, so. Well, we can. I'm not sure if I want to. <laughs> it's kind of part of my vocabulary. <laughs> well, they're words. Welcome to Down and Dirty Marketing. We have a lot to discuss today. I've been talking with the panelists on trying to pick their brains, in addition to some of the feedback I got from last year's panel. So we're going to go for a huge thing. I figure we'll do half hour of uh, these fine folks. And then we will do Q&A, if that works for you guys. Um, I'm out of it, but let's start with Jenny at the end and do introductions and I'll finish last. Hello, my name is Jenny Breeden. I do a daily web com journal webcomic that's called The Devil's Panties. It's not as, as naughty as it sounds, I know. I started it in 2001. I update it every day. I have several Hi, I'm Gail C. Martin. I write the Chronicles of the Necromancer epic fantasy series for Solaris Books, the Ascending Kingdoms epic fantasy for Orbit, Deadly Curiosities Urban Fantasy, and the new steampunk Iron and Blood. And on the other side of my life, I write marketing books because that's what I've done for over 25 years. So 30 Days to Social Media Success and five other marketing books. You can find me all weekend at Author's Lair in the Vendor Room. Hi, everybody. Hi. Hi. My name is Stephanie Burke. Right now, I am a multi-published, multi-award-winning author. I've been doing this for over 15 years, so yay! Still hanging in there. Uh, book number 76 just dropped about two weeks ago, and God willing, there'll be many, many more. So in order to keep myself up to date and cross my genres, because I write everything from horror, hard sci-fi, high fantasy, fantasy, LBGT stories, you name it, I'm going to do it. So in order to keep everybody in the world liking me and actually being aware of me, promotions are important. My name is Cage Allen, and I have never won shit. <laughs> <laughs> I'm an LGBT author. I write mostly comedy, although I am branching out. Uh, I've written four novels. I've been part of four anthologies, two more coming up, so it'll be a total of six. And I've got uh, my first ebook novella, and print copy version will be coming out in I think a week and a half and it's my first self pub that I'm working on because I'd like to learn that side of the business as well. And oh, you're done? I'm done. Okay. My short and sweet. Uh, TC Blue, I write gay romance across various subgenres and I am currently working with five publishers uh, and getting into doing some paranormal as well. I'm Karen and Kelly. I've been writing and published for about 10 years. I've got 15 novels of our 80 shorter works in print and ebook. I write for a variety of houses. Um, I have not won shit, but I have won an award. Um, <laughs> Wait, if you won an award, then how did you not win shit? Because it wasn't shit. It was oh, okay. an actual award. Sorry, was... I understand now. You're so little. See what I did there? <laughs> so that's me. <laughs> My name is Sasha Levich. I am the industry acknowledged bad boy of romance. I have over 50 titles published through a variety of publishers. Um, I am represented by M. Corvisiero Literary Agency. I edit for two houses as well, and that's pretty much me. So. Who calls you the bad Lots of people, actually. Who? That's the name he made Other up than for you. himself. No, I, no, I did not. I did but not pick that up. you made it, but through promotions, everybody picked it up. So now you can lie and say somebody else well, gave it Sin, to you. Sinarge, Sinarge Garth actually had started that because I was afraid. So because of this discussion, I was afraid years ago to come out as a male romance author because we're kind of frowned upon or used to be frowned upon. And a buddy of mine who's been writing for almost as long as Stephanie and I anyway, and she came up and said, Sasha, no, own this. It's a unique thing. It's a marketing tool. 
and then the rest of it just kind of came from there. So, let's start off with the questions. Um, your biggest lessons you've learned marketing. What are they? No paper promo. Seriously, bookmarks and things are cute, but people tend to collect them and then throw them in the trash when they get home. You need something that's going to be, oh, thank you. You need something that's going to be memorable and something that people aren't too quick to discard. Right now, a lot of places will not even accept paper promo for conventions and things like that, so keep that in mind. Postcards are great when you're handing out or at a book signing or at a function like this because people can take notes on the back of them and remember what they were talking about. But all those little paper flyers and the bookmarks of yesteryear, I have thousands and thousands of them in the recycling bin. Now, I'm going to slightly disagree because I use them a little differently. First off, I, I make mine through Vistaprint, and I always buy them on sale, and I buy the business card size for um, my book covers with information on the back with a QR code that takes them straight to my website. Or I buy the oversized postcard and split the graphic in fourths so that I've got um, bookmark sizes and then sit there when I'm watching something on TV and cut them into, into fourths. But here's how I use them. When I do a signing, I sit there and go, hi, did you get a bookmark? Everybody wants a bookmark. Hey, they come on over to the table, and then I've got them for about a minute to make my pitch. So for me, at store signings, at booth signings, that's how I pull people in with a free gift of a bookmark. If they throw it away later, I got to talk to them. So that's okay. Yeah. And it cost me squat. Yeah. So put your uh, URL on everything in a way that it can't be uh, stickered over or cropped out. Because if somebody shares something, especially with this um, social media, if somebody shares something, uh, you want to be able to, if it takes off, you have no idea if something's going to go viral, that whoever sees it can find you again. Because whatever advertising you do, it's lost if they can't actually come back to your stuff. So get the website, get the URL, put that URL on everything. Gail mentioned QR codes. These things are awesome and they're important. Get them while they're free because you take one picture with a smartphone and it will automatically take you to the website or to whatever links that you have. So those things are very, very important to remember. They're inexpensive, but they're tiny little things that can fit on anything. Mm -hmm. I had a lady who uh, I tried to give her a flyer and she said, oh, I don't, I don't take physical items. I don't take any paper. And I was like, well, I've got a QR code. She was like, oh, okay, and click that. And so if somebody doesn't want to walk around with a bunch of stuff, and then it's in her phone. We'll keep talking down here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You guys don't jump in. Flash now, just keep this going. What was yeah. the question? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one thing that's a little bit different from everybody else that I've learned, at least in the last three years, is one of the rules that I had before for myself, which were really stupid and I've broken since, is that I didn't want to write short stories. I started writing short stories because I got involved in anthologies with these two women down here and several other people. Guilty. Um, what we ended up doing, though, and it became a series <laughs> we called the Buttthology. It was butt pirates in space, butt ninjas from hell, <laughs> butt babes in boyland, and butt riders on the range. It, and when you've got a series like this, people will start to remember. If they've seen one, they'll start looking it up and look at the other things. But when you're with eight authors or seven authors, um, I came from comedy, they came from romance, suddenly we've got this mix, and people who have read them pick up the book, and they've started looking at my stuff, they've started looking at Kiernan's stuff, or my people have started looking at Kiernan's, or Tiz's, and pretty soon you've got all this cross going on, and their readers are starting to pick me up, and my readers are starting to pick them up, and I'm starting to get book sales out of it. And reviewers have started going back to my older titles, and they're pulling those in, and they're reading them, and they're doing reviews on it. So that's been fantastic for someone who didn't want to get involved in it. Mm -hmm. <coughs> yeah, I, I've got to jump in and, and say anthologies can be a terrific marketing tool if you're savvy about which anthologies you go into, if you're working with a publisher that is really going to produce a good book and knows how to market it. I've had whole new series come out of stories that I did for a prompt in an anthology, and then I finished the short story and said, wow, that, you know, I want to take this further. But I've also had people find me in an anthology because they bought the book because of another author in the anthology that they were more familiar with. They read my story too and said, oh, I like this. Oh, there's the contact information at the end of the story. I'll go find out what else she's done. And so I've gotten new people from that. So 
it can be a really powerful marketing tool. And we, go ahead. Thank you. I'm a firm believer of not putting all your eggs in one basket. So uh, I don't write for just one publisher. I write for several different publishers. Um, and what, I'm, what I found over the years is that each publishing house has its own built-in readership. Um, and while there are people that cross over, especially in the genre that I write in, um, they, they are, there are house-specific uh, readers who will find me in that house and then they'll um, Google my backlist and they'll find me in other houses. So the, you know, one house built of readers will find me and I grow my readership that way. That's another important point. Do not overlook social media. You might not like it, but guess what? You have to be out there. If the public does not see you, they can forget you really, really easy. So keep your, up, your websites updated. Keep your backlogs updated there. Make it easy to remember. Um, we were talking earlier about Google+, Plus, uh, Twitter, there's Instagram, they even do Snapchats now. So all these social medias, it, um, different types of social media you might want to get interested in because it makes you seem more accessible to the reader. You know, if you have, it's like the used car salesman, you go to a uh, used car a lot to buy a used car. You stay because of the personality of the person that is actually selling it to you. Because if they take you off, you can walk off and you're gonna buy a car. You can go someplace else and get it. Remember the same thing applies to writers. I'm not trying to say pretend to be something you're not, but just be accessible and be personable. And social media in general, each platform has its own different way of interacting and being used. What have you guys found that's been a major difference that authors need to know? One thing that really annoys me, for example, Facebook, when people belong to multiple author groups or multiple groups in the same genre and they have a new release and they post in every single group. So now I get 20,000 emails that are identical that say, hey, buy my book, it's this, this, this. That annoys the hell out of me. Be, be selective. Um, and where you where you promo, don't promo to like a bajillion different groups that have the same readership, that have the same membership, because it just gets annoying that people start ignoring you. I, Unless. I stagger media and, and entertainment. Mm -hmm. So I've got Twitter, I've, I've got a, a business Twitter account and a personal Twitter account, and I, and I use the personal for the, because people follow you. I follow a lot of writer, writers on Twitter, and I'm interested in, uh, they post, where they're going to be for a signing, and then they post something witty about their breakfast, and then they, you know, and they post once a day. You're not gonna. You, I unfollow some people who post too much, and so, so yeah, you have a new release, and you post about that, and then you also post something interesting that you saw, or so you got to stagger information and entertainment. And it should be the thing that you post on on social media should be something relevant to the book itself, but not a definite hard sell. A uh, buddy of mine uh, writes spy thrillers, and he has a tech background, so he will post about the book once a day, give or take, and then all these interesting things from his technical background relating to spy craft, or weapon training, or Stephanie for uh, her hump day. Uh, Every thing. Wednesday, I do this thing called the hump day hump. Mm -hmm. Now, um, we, I have to keep a tight lock on it. You have to be a member and pictures can't be shared out unless you also are a member because I've run into Facebook stalkers who are not very friendly. But what I do in this hump day hump is I interact with my uh, readers and my followers because not all followers are readers. Some people are just there to have fun. And um, they'll give me a topic and I'll find as many half naked men and women in interesting almost sexual positions that I can find that runs along this theme. And the theme can be anything because they suggest it. And we've gone from classic uh, uh, erotic, uh, erotica from like the 12th century to, you know, weird circuses to bees. So if they throw something out there, I'm going to try to make it as entertaining as I can. And I bill it as, you know, it's the hump day hump. Come for the sexy photos, stay for the snark. Because we will do all <laughs> kinds of things in there. Like we do the what the fuck moment when we just pit, I poke post as many weird pictures as I can and we just tear the stuff up. I mean, uh, uh, avant-garde uh, fashion is really good for that. And everybody just comes and has a good time. But because of that, we have a lot of readers that come in. And if I'm doing a theme and say it's Merman, 
and somebody has a book that's out that's about mermen or mermaids or whatever, I'll tell them to come in, say something, post a book cover, and talk about it. Because so many people come up, show up just to be smart. Because, you know, everybody loves a good snark. They show up to look and make comments, and they will comment about that, that book, that particular book. Authors also come in, because I challenge them. I do an author challenge. And I will post a picture and go, all right, write me a story about that, or write a first line about that, or explain this. So many people get book ideas from doing that, and we've actually had four successful anthologies that I've been a part of come off because of one picture. We had a bunch of soccer guys all standing, you know, Brit, um, not you, uh, uh, soccer, not American football, soccer. And these guys are standing there in the middle of these two guys in this like dramatic clinch, like tongues down each other's throats. And it's like, okay, do, do a story about this. And somebody challenged me back, and we wound up writing the, um, uh, uh, what was it called? Bounds. Yeah, thank you. The Out of Bounds series. And that sold very, very well, so we're doing Out of Bounds too. Other authors have come on and they've gotten ideas for their story. And if somebody says, hey, I need a picture about, uh, I don't know, Tyrannosaurus Rex doing some chick, I will try to find that. If somebody tells me I need bondage with, I don't know, latex and, you know, pegging, I'll find as much stuff as I can do with that and push that in. But everybody comes in, everybody has a good time. And that's the main point. It's something for everybody. Everybody comes in and everybody is enjoying themselves. Don't be afraid to make friends with other authors and cross promote each other's work. That really takes it a long way because every author has a core following. But most readers read a lot of books, not just from a single author. So if you make friends with other authors and you cr cross promote each other's work, the people who like the same things in common are going to A, thank you for introducing them to a new author. You're not losing a sale out of that. They, they're, they can only read what you've written if, you, if they want to read more than what you've got out there. Uh, that's great. You're not losing any sales. But when you cross promote with each other, it doesn't get old when you're talking about, hey, there's this new book, it's by a friend of mine, you ought to check it out. They, they promote your book. Now it, it feels a little more authentic than just saying, buy my book, buy my book. Two questions real quick too. <clears throat> How many people in the audience are writers right now? Okay, let me ask you this Wonderful. because this actually will kind of go somewhere, but one of the things that bugs me is when I see somebody online who is an author and I, and I know very little about them, you can't tell very little about them by their posts. So it goes into this question, how many of you have a blog? How often do you update it? I mean, are you regular? Do you do it once or twice? Because one of the things that I've actually been working on for about five, six years is building up a blog audience. I do it usually twice a week, sometimes three, because I feature a series on Saturday every once in a while where I will have a guest writer write in. Um, but I do it every week, and you can do it a mix of, I mean, you can do some promotion, I, I will mix it up, but I mean, I go all over the spectrum. I've got a father who has is in his sixth year of advanced Alzheimer's, I will talk about Alzheimer's, and you can't believe the people that come out of the woodwork for this, but you don't talk about it every week. Talk about my husband's grand monster when she visits from Hong Kong. Those are hysterical because she is evil. <laughs> And people love those stories, and they get to know a bit of you, they get to know a bit of your quirk, your humor, and they will start catching on to that. And when you come out with a new release, you almost don't even have to promote it sometimes to some people because they will go and seek it out based on your personality and how you've come across. Right, you become an autobite. Yeah, and that's just been from blogging, and it's a pain in the ass sometimes to come up with two posts a week when you've been doing it five, six years. But if you keep up with it, and people know that on Monday and on Thursday, they're gonna be able to go to your, to your blog and read it and either be amused or shed a tear or whatever, you build up a really nice readership. And it also helps your SEO uh, because Google ranks uh, on search engine information based on um, keyword density and they change the rules a lot. Every 60 days or thereabouts, Google is trying to screw things up so that the people who are paying for SEO get ahead and the rest of us don't get that so much. Well, I think one of the other things is to become familiar with Facebook so that when so that you really know what the rules are. One of the things that Facebook in its infinite stupidity does is it has a rule about ads that says that only 20% of the ad can have text on it. And apparently Facebook is too dumb to recognize a book cover as opposed to a graphic. I have this conversation with them on occasion. Um, so there are ways you can post a book cover and have 
them not, uh, if, if you want to boost the post so that more people see it, um, there are ways to post that book cover so Facebook is smart enough to figure out it's a book, and other ways that will get them to say, oh, I'm sorry, that, that's not a book, that's a graphic, so we can't allow it through. Boosting a post is important because Facebook has gotten kind of grabby and greedy, big surprise, and just because you have people who have friended you or followed your fan page doesn't mean everybody sees every post you make. In fact, organic reach, that's the reach that you're not paying for, is sometimes as low as I've seen, you know, three to five percent. So that means that all those people you've invested in getting to like your page aren't necessarily seeing what you post. And so when you do a boosted post for five bucks or ten bucks or whatever you throw at it, now all of a sudden more people are getting to see your post. That can be really helpful when you've got a new book release out or you're going to an event. I've been playing even with micro amounts of a buck or two and it still, it still gets a nice bump. But um, if they don't allow your book cover because they are not smart enough to know it's a book cover, then you can't boost your post. So you've got to get used to Facebook and its stupid rules so that you can better promote your books. Now are you targeting those posts? Demographic-wise? Yeah, I am targeting them. Sometimes I'm targeting them to um, specific demographics. Sometimes I just want it to go out to my followers and their friends. And um, some of the tricks for getting the book post through is if you link to the book on Amazon and allow that to bring the thumbnail up as opposed to attaching the book cover as a graphic, Facebook will figure out it's a book. If it's not, for example, on Amazon, uh, for example, Facebook hates Wattpad's link. Um, what I've been told by Facebook is if you take a picture of the book, like on a coffee table or on a table, so that you can see it in context, hey, stupid, this is a book, um, then Facebook will allow the graphic to go through. But if you have a tightly cropped book cover and it's not related to an Amazon link and it's not um, something they can see isn't just an ad, your odds are 50-50 or less that they'll let it go through, which gets really frustrating pretty fast when you're trying to get something done. And it's interesting you should mention Amazon because they're doing some stupid now. <laughs> if you are friends with an author and you post, uh, a, a, say a friend of yours posted a review and they think that this person is a friend of yours, they'll pull the review down. So right now you have so to only enemies are allowed to read your books. Yeah, and, and which, total strangers. Yeah, and wow, some of the stuff you get with that. But no, and I think all this started because a few years ago, published um, authors were writing their own reviews for their own stuff and putting it up there. Well, and, yeah, and authors are also buying reviews. Yeah, and that's criminal in my mind because mm -hmm. it's. Yeah, but that's an old that's an old trick that we that the uh, uh, adult industry used to use to get sales on their sites was to have other buddies write the stuff for them or write the review under a different name. Yeah. The problem is that when when for example when you're talking about the genre that we that we write in it's so small we all know each other, you know, <laughs> lots of authors know each other. Authors are also readers, and a lot of readers know the author personally so when they review the book their reviews wind up getting taken down which isn't fair yeah, because obviously we're all here getting to know you so that you get to know us and maybe you follow us home with our books well you know again if, if Amazon looks at it and says wow you guys actually connect with each other on social media so you can't post uh, a review it's, it's kind of counterproductive yeah they're shooting themselves in the foot and hopefully they'll figure this out fingers crossed, but you know, Amazon seems to be setting the industry standard lately. So. Well, it's less of an issue for James Patterson and Stephen King, who have millions of readers and haven't met all of those millions. For small press publishers, for yeah. mid-listers, for people who do get out and meet the readers, it's more of an issue because we've made the investment in getting to know people. Yeah. So how do you guys feel, or how do you guys negotiate the Amazon game? Because Amazon itself has its own SEO algorithms. I cry a lot. <laughs> <laughs> and then I go in and I use the keywords. If I'm doing a story, I just won't say it's a gay interracial shapeshifter story. I'll go in and I'll throw in as much as I can, not just those buzzwords. I'll add other stuff in like, uh, Alpha's switching, and I'll put in uh, wolf lovers and anything like that. Something that's would reach the audience 
with those when they do the buzzwords that would reach people that might not usually reach. And this is your copy that you write that on, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, you have to. You have to go back and you have to because if everybody, shapeshifters are big in paranormal right now. And if you put a shapeshifter, how many thousands of other authors also have shapeshifter on theirs? You get flooded. But if you toss in some specifics and some things that are unique to your story, like the Alpha, Beta, beta Omega world, I didn't even realize when I typed those in there, it got huge. I got more following of that because people have seen this thousands of times in fan fiction, but nobody ever saw really like an original story with this stuff in it. So it's a huge world now. And that pulled me a lot of readers, and it was with a multi-author anthology. Mm -hmm. So It's also important to go in and make an Amazon author page, yes. Yes. which a lot of people don't bother to do, and I think that's extremely important to do. Well, and, and something a lot of people overlook on that Amazon author page is there's a little button that says follow this author. And so if you encourage the people who, who really care about always knowing what's new with your book to follow your Amazon fan page, Amazon will let everybody who's bought your books through Amazon know when you have a new release coming out. Now, you don't have all that contact data, but Amazon does. So encourage people to not only like your Facebook page or your blog or your Twitter, but encourage them, send them that link to not only see your Amazon author page, but follow you through Amazon so they don't come up to you and go, oh, wow, I didn't know you have three new books out. And the more you do that, the more you get boosted. Um, Amazon will also, if you read this book, you might like these mm -hmm. books. So mm -hmm. you'll, that's important because it might be something completely not in your genre at all. But somebody might like the description, the blurb, the cover, the characters, anything, and that will pop up there and it can get you more readers. And I'm going to say that if you like your authors and you want to keep us writing stories, the single biggest thing you can do for us, other than buying our books and telling your friends about them, is to go put a review on Amazon. Go put stars on Goodreads because that affects the algorithms. Stories, books that don't have enough stars don't get in that. If you like this book, you might like another one. And the, they get lost. They get yeah, totally they get lost. lost. So if you like an author, keep them in business by writing those nice reviews and giving us stars. That keeps <coughs> our books out there. And it also keeps your name up in Google. Right, mm -hmm. right now, I love this. Um, there's a Stephanie Burke who's an uh, uh, erotic artist. There's a Stephanie Burke who's a politician, and there's a Stephanie Burke who's a lawyer. And on the Stephanie Burke lawyer's website, she has at the bottom a disclosure that says, I am not affiliated with that smut peddler. And then she has the link to my um, website underneath it. This is the Stephanie Burke you want. Oh my God, I love it. I send people to there all the time because it's like, wow, she's getting hit off of that. But because she spelled my name right and put the link up properly, that's giving me more people. Because they'll go look for a lawyer and go, wait a minute, it's my peddler? Okay, let me go check this out. Have you ever contacted me? One time I did, and I apologized that so many people were are writing about when was the next gay werewolf love story coming up. Uh, now, is that for the lawyer or the politician? Because I'm thinking if the smut peddler links on the politician's page, you'll get even more traffic. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But no, with the politicians, we run into trouble because apparently she's not a good politician. So uh, None of them are. I get her mail sometimes, and it's like, why would you do I don't even live in Tennessee. I'm so sorry. No, it's not me. But, you know, this is the shyster that you want, you know, but if you want to read something, I can write something about Tennessee. I don't, <laughs> I don't live in Tennessee, but I can send you something with some laws about the werewolves. <laughs> I told this story last night, too. It's important, to, if, if you're a writer, to Google your name before you invest in it. Um, when I took my pen name, I did not do that. And it wasn't until after my first book came out that I actually Googled my pen name and found out that he was also a serial killer in England. <laughs> So I, I said last night, my, my most memorable moment was when I Googled my name and I came up before him. <laughs> it was yay. like, yay, I made it. <laughs> More than the serial killer. <laughs> he's in jail, I think. Uh, yeah, he, they caught him. Well, and honestly, yeah, no, but you have, I have a prison following. Yeah, so do I. I'm not yeah. quite sure how they managed to get I, the books. I, because a couple of years ago, there was a thing um, that would be allowed the prisoners to read what they can, what they call paranormal or erotica, and it was huge in, in the news, at least in Oakland. I did, um, I did a, a convention. I did St. Pete's Pride one year, 
and a gentleman came up to my booth and said, I'm being sent to prison and bought like $100 worth of my books. I'm like, that's so totally awesome. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, they're locking you yeah. up, but well, and who, <laughs> thanks for taking for my sales. books with you. <laughs> right, thanks Googling for my yourself. books in that prison library. I don't want to think about the condition they're in now, but it's okay. <laughs> Googling yourself is important just to make sure that, A, you're not getting confused with someone else. B, it helps you find the pirated works that are out there, um, you know, about you. And it helps, it, if there is something wrong, it gives you a heads up that you can go out and fix it. So Google yourself periodically. It's not narcissistic, it's business. When you mentioned the pirate sites, last week for craps and giggles i have been googling the new story that's coming out just to see where it's cropping up on websites which i thought because it's self-published it's going to be like an amazon australia it's on japan it's in italy and i'm thinking this is really cool i've never had stuff over there and then i found a goddamn pirate site with a listing for the book and i'm like can i download it now because it's not even out yet it's not but they're anticipating its arrival <laughs> do we have that annoying box sweet uh so i want to take this time to get you guys questions you guys is. You guys is. That's why he has an editor. I'm tired tonight. Hi, yeah, this is for Miss Kelly. Yes. I wanted to know you mentioned um, being in different houses. Mm -hmm. How does your how does the contracts work? Because I would imagine don't some of them want you to only go through them. That was I would last not, night. That was last night's panel. Yeah, I would not sign a contract mm -hmm. um, that wanted exclusivity with my pen name, because that this is a business and. In order to make money at this business, especially when you're published with, in our genre, you need to be able to, to spread out. How um, many of you uh, actively track the uh, impact of your advertising, or do you have someone do it for you over and above the analytics you talked about? I've actually been tracking the uh, Facebook stuff because when Slowburn came out, I was getting paranoid that the numbers began to slip and running out of ideas. and put a boosted post up on, on our ad rather on Facebook and left my demographics really, really wide open and shotgun blasted everything. And I discovered that uh, females between the ages of 24 and 30 and males in the same category were clicking on the link and they were all sp uh, from Spain. Mm -hmm. And luckily I speak enough Spanish to advertise my own books that way, so there's that. I track because my website is done with WordPress because I'm poor. I'm an author. <laughs> but they have a wonderful feature where they can tell you how many hits a day that you have. They also tell you um, what time of day and what particular thing you were doing that boosted that. Now along with the Amazon author pages, you do have this. You have this wonderful tracking tool. It'll tell you your ranking. It'll tell you what sold, when it's selling. and actually some demographic information about who was buying. So that's important just to keep track of what works and what doesn't. So if you had like, well I know the Hump Day Hump boosts sales all the time. So I've been doing that religiously for the past five years every Wednesday. And that's great because when I have a release and I announce it before Wednesday, the, um, the, the sales on that shoot up. But I can tell like two weeks later they start, you know, the, the decline that you would see, but every time I do something major like that, it boosts sales up. So, you know, keeping your name out there and just being sociable, this I've discovered. But works. You, you don't want to drive yourself nuts with it either. Yeah, I mean, the, the key thing here is yes, you have to promote, and you have to promote consistently, and that means you have to do something every day. But your key business is writing. And so you don't want to get so caught up in the promotion or so caught up in doing clever blog stuff that you don't get time to write the books. Yeah. So it really, and sometimes that means you give up sleep. But um, you have to do both, but you have to make sure you, you, you know, leave yourself the time to actually write the books. You have to schedule it. And like I said, the hump is so massive, it takes me five days to gather up all the photos, the information, because I do throw some factual information about some topics in there. And it takes me about five or six days to do that, just in time to have the hump and then start all over again. But I schedule two to three hours a day just to sit down and do that and to you know, get topics that people might find interesting. You have to schedule your promotions. Mm -hmm. I mean, 
it, it's, a, it's a job, it's a business. You have fun doing it as much as you can, but if you don't, it's easy to find yourself overwhelmed or falling behind. And you can automate some of that. Mm -hmm. I don't recommend that to start with, but for those who are on Twitter, you've got Hootsuite, and there's, uh, what's the other one? Um, TweetDeck, yeah, thank you. Yeah. That allow you to schedule posts. So I had a bunch of posts up for Twitter that this weekend, they were scheduled, and I've been either with these guys or smoking cigars somewhere, and Twitter's working for me. The lady in pink has the orange box, and then we need to pass it to this, this lady on, on the corner there. So um, I write fiction and nonfiction. Do you guys have any commentary on um, the way that those two differ or the ways that they're critically similar? I, I think that your audience is probably different uh, between fiction and nonfiction. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, sometimes that might not be the case, but in general, um, and I don't write nonfiction, but it seems to me that that would be something that you would need to market and promote differently, you know? Yeah, um, I, I write both. And the people who buy my nonfiction are small business owners. They're looking for marketing <coughs> information, or they're authors, and they, they want small business information. So it's, it's a much more professional, fun, but not as much fun as we have on the fiction side, because it needs to stay professional, and it needs to stay focused on the business side. You can do crazy, fun stuff uh, like your hump day hump when you're talking about fiction yeah. but you can't you got to keep it suitable for work you, you've got to keep it focused and, and professional with the the nonfiction you don't want to bore people you can still make it fun but you still have to be fun within a few more limits you know you can always contract outside help with that too we are blessed in the back to have the look at them not paying attention at all but the pit my author ladies Angela and Audrey raise your hands just one, just one oh Where's Angela? Angela, Angela booked. Well, because I was going to yell at her. But um, Audrey is there, and what they do is if you cannot be at a convention, you can send them promotion, promotion material. They'll make gift baskets and make sure that your name is basically pimped out at that convention. Now, you're doing business and professional. If you... I don't write fiction, so I'm not quite sure how it works. You mean Yeah. I'm, I don't, I'm tired, sorry. I don't write nonfiction. But from my scattered brain, what it's, it's pulling is that some things you don't want to personally have your face at to appear because it might affect what you've been writing in the nonfiction. You can always contract a third party like the Pimp My Author ladies and they can do it for you. And that keeps your numbers up. I write, um, I do write, I don't write nonfiction, but I do write young adult as well as my adult stuff. And I keep them separate and they're marketed a little bit differently because they're marketed, for example, um, for my, my adult stuff, I might post something naughty or, I'm, you know, but my young adult stuff, yeah, me. <laughs> but my young adult stuff, obviously, I would not do that. So it's just a matter of filters. Well, that, what you're talking about with Pimp My Authors, that leads perfectly to my question. I don't have a lot of money, but I would like to throw a little bit of money toward professional marketing. Now, I see all the things that say, you know, we'll sell 20,000 copies of your book, and they all seem like scams. If I'm going to spend money... They are. Yes, they are. Yeah. If I'm going to spend my money, I don't want to spend it on a scam artist. Are there legitimate avenues that you would recommend that I could use? I've not employed anybody or a service like that, so I really can't weigh in on that, sorry. You can hire virtual assistants who are people with skills like a, as if you were hiring a secretary or somebody to work in person with you, but they don't work in your place of business. They work from their home or their wherever and, and you just work with each other over the internet, but they can do tasks for you. So, for example, I work with a couple of virtual assistants. I have them work for me several hours a month. They post some of my basic tweets to Hootsuite so that when I'm gone, when I'm traveling, when I'm on a plane and I can't stay on social media, there's something coming out regularly and I don't just fall off the, off, you know, the radar. I write all those tweets and then they post them for me. I have somebody who I write my blog posts and then they go in and they post them for me, make sure that they are up there and they clean off the spam comments and they, they do some of that stuff for me. And I've hired them through sites like elance.com or guru.com, just the way you'd hire somebody to come clean your gutters or, or 
uh, you know, come work for you at a business. And, and if you look for somebody who has social media skills and you need somebody to help you keep things getting posted or write some things for you or help you with that, you can hire through those channels and get somebody who's a legitimate business person. And you can also develop a street team. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask about that actually. Mm -hmm. yeah. I'm still developing my business plan or my model for my street team, but uh, PJ Snyder has one of the most effective street teams I have ever seen. Her people will go to conventions, they'll hand out the promo for her, they'll uh, po repost emails, they'll let her know what the people, they'll take notes in different areas and they'll get back to her what the people are saying, what they would like to see changed, what they like to see more of. And that's a really effective tool because you don't have to be there standing over their shoulder to do it. You just hand them, you know, give them a mention in a book. Sometimes it's sending them some personalized promo or swag just for them, or like the street team t-shirts. And people love doing things for their favorite authors. Thank you. I was wondering, do you have to take any kinds of security precautions with the promotions that, that tell your audience where you're going to be and when you're going to be there? I got well, uh, extra security for my house. Seriously? Uh, well, back and forth. Uh, we were living in a bad neighborhood. And one person, once I was like, oh, yeah, I got robbed again. Uh, somebody was like, oh, don't tell anybody when you go to a convention. No, that's no, that's not an option. I wanted to see you. That's why I wanted to do. Yeah, yeah no. So, so um, we, for our neighborhood, because we had a bad neighborhood, we uh, made sure that a car was parked in our driveway. We made sure that neighbors would pick, pick up an email that was left on the front steps. We invested in security doors. Um, I paid money to keep my name out of the yellow pages, the white pages, for my address because I do write erotic and romance. I've been blessed with like five stalkers and sometimes the stalkers can get serious. But if you take common sense precautions, you don't tell people when you're going on vacation. Mm -hmm. You're gonna be at this convention, but you know, if you keep your address out of there, nobody's gonna be looking around to find you. If somebody is stalking you at a convention, and I've had that happen before, I just grabbed some con husbands. I had some really big guys that walked around with me that was a little bit of added protection. But you have to be aware of what you're putting out in social media there are a lot of sick people out there, and they'll take advantage of that. So use common sense, protect yourself. And like I said, make sure, if, especially if you're writing romance and erotica, that they cannot easily get to your address. Um, they don't know what town you're in because sometimes they will stalk your children. I have two kids. I don't want my kids in that danger. And that goes, once again, common sense. My, picture, my, my children's picture outside of costuming never were on any type of uh, social media that I had until they were adults. My son is 19, my daughter just graduated, she's 17. Now I'm okay to post a picture with them because they're not minors and I've trained them to understand this is what mommy does. I'm sorry it's gonna impact your life this way, but you have to be careful. So yeah. just common sense things. I refer to my kids uh, by nicknames even now that they're 16, 20, and, and 23. And the one time I did post my, my oldest daughter's picture with her name uh, on my Facebook page for the first time uh, was her college graduation because I told her if she could move to New York City by herself, I think she was tough enough to be on my Facebook page. Yeah, right. <laughs> I changed I, everybody's names in the comic. I got a P.O. box. I use the P.O. box for all the business stuff. Oh yeah, P.O. boxes. Um, I'm careful about whatever picture I take. Like, oh, the sunset's nice, but I'm gonna make sure it doesn't have any uh, landmarks that I take a picture outside of my house or anything. Um, somebody's going to find you because the internet uh, and so you just make sure that, that you double check stuff um, you know you double check anybody coming you know at the house you make sure that you've got a uh, friend's family I, I've got a friend who she's a writer and she makes sure that everybody knows about her wonderful Rottweilers that she has <laughs> See, I do something similar I just tell them my husband's grand monster is staying that particular weekend because <laughs> I tell them too if I'm ever in a shark tank if I'm standing next to her I know I'm not getting bit <laughs> but by the same token with my husband too he works for a company that it's uh, they have let go people for they have found out who are gay they are not afraid of it. They have stymied their uh, ability to progress the company. So I don't mention his name. Or I come up with very charming nicknames that he hates. <laughs> and I'll use that. And there are people who know him, and there are people who know me, but 
outside of our group of friends, I, I keep that very, very separate for that reason alone. But His Majesty is a doll. Yeah. <laughs> yes. There's, there's the, the reason why so many people write under pen names. It's just yeah. an added layer of protection. Uh, what, Who's got the what blog buttons? platform do you guys use? I mean, do you use Facebook or do you use WordPress? WordPress. Well, I mean, you know, WordPress. what what media site? WordPress. 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 But I also, if I post something on my WordPress site, there is um, a couple of other sites that I will put it on too. There's one called Authors Den, and I have an audience on Authors Den. There's another one. It used to be my salon. I think it's now called Our Salon. And I actually will get a lot of views on our salon. I wish it was in just one place. It was on my site. It's not. But in those three places, I get a tremendous number of hits. And Author's Den has been really, really good. Well, and you can also get it set up so that your blog automatically hits your Goodreads page, hits your website, hits other sites. Hits Amazon, sites. Amazon, Amazon. Hits Amazon. All of my stuff aggregates. So I, I post every day, and as soon as it goes up on my website, it also gets posted to Facebook and Twitter and uh, Tumblr. And I'm starting to look into um, the picture thing the kids are doing Instagram. now. Pinterest. Instagram. Instagram, yeah. Instagram, yeah. Okay. You know so, what? so making sure that it's everywhere, and then also has the URL so they can get back to the original and they can get all the information. There's a wonderful program called RSS Graffiti. Mm -hmm. If you link that, you can make a post at one place, and it will post it wherever blogs or any place any, any place you want to send it to, basically. And that's wonderful because instead of copying, pasting, or redoing this, you can just post something once and have it go out. There's Thunderclap, too. I never used that. I have. Uh, well, I've been part of, of promotions that have used Thunderclap, which is basically a site that gets people to sign up in advance for permission to blast out a uh, pre-written tweet about like a, a book coming out online or a Kickstarter starting. And then on a certain day at a certain time, it blasts out that tweet across all of the people's feeds who have given it permission to, and that's why they call it thunderclap because it's one big noise at one time to get the word out. Um, I'm not sure how well it works, but I figure it can't hurt. <laughs> the hardest thing about thunderclap that I've found is getting everyone else to, not so much to reciprocate, but then, or to, to back your thunderclap, but then they want your backing as well. Mm -hmm. So what you end up with is a feed on certain days where you've just got shit tons of other people's posts on there, which is fine, but they're so close together in a lot of cases. As a, as a, a, a thundercrap, thunderclap, thunderclap. <laughs> <laughs> I'm really, I'm really That's a Freudian slip, yeah. 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 Ever. <laughs> we Freudian have a, a lady with the orange box. Oh, she yeah. has right here. Um, yes, I was wondering if you guys could talk about, uh, a little bit about uh, if you use agents or uh, publishers, how you guys found your agents and publishers, where you looked? Okay. Agent oh. query? I work with small agent press, so I don't use an agent at all, ever. No, I don't have an agent, but after like five or six different publishing houses, I had Lauren Schoen, who's one of my favorite sci-fi authors, tag me and says, yeah, this is my agent, call him, you need this, because you're doing too much on your own. But um, Piers Anthony, Mm -hmm. For publishing houses, uh, predators and editors, that's a good place to start. Do your research on it. And uh, basically see, I know right now a lot of agents have um, Twitter. Mm -hmm. A lot of agents have Twitter and they post things on their Twitters. So just do the research with the authors, um, agents who are actually accepting authors in the genre you want. Ask some of the authors or check out some of the authors that they've done and um, what the success rate with the, with the uh, publishers of the authors that they have and go from there. Yeah, Writer's Digest books have, have always put out um, an annual guide to literary agents. It's probably now completely online. And it'll tell you um, all the information about the, uh, the agents, who the, what types of genres they represent, who some of their big clients are. You narrow down your list of good agents and you want ones that are AAR signatures, which is American Author Representative, that means that you don't pay them any money yourself. They only make a percentage of what you sell your book for. So they only have an incentive to take you on as a client if they think they can sell your work. Then you go out to their website and you see if anything's changed and you see what, what it says on the website. And then, then you write the best damn query you can write 
And if it if you circulated that query out there and it's not getting anything, it may not be your book. It may be your query letter. Go back and write the next best query letter you can and, and see if you hit something. It, gonna, it takes patience. I'm going to tell you what was told to me when I was heading, because I've been blessed to not have a lot of rejections, but most of my rejections have come from agents when I was trying to shop the book around about four or five years ago. And it was... Nancy over at uh, Night Agency. Nancy, 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 Nancy. I was upset because I got three rejections on fucking Valentine's Day. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, so Nancy had come back to me and said, so what's, what's going on? And I said, I haven't shot you guys a query yet, but this is what I'm sending out, and this is what I'm getting, and she helped me with it. And then when I fired it off to Lori Perkins, um, Lori Perkins gave me two of her agents. Okay. No. No. Writers Beware is another mm -hmm. uh, website that's good, you know, similar to Predators and Editors, mm -hmm. because they actually rank a lot of different agents and they know, okay, this person is scamming people, Yeah. you know. That book you mentioned too, I found two of my publishers through there originally, mm -hmm. so it does work. I walked around to different publishers at conventions just so I could kind of look them in the eye and everything and asked around friends in the community and, and they would recommend different publishers to me and when I got there, uh, the, the publishing contracts from them, I would take the contract to a lawyer and I would pay the couple hundred dollars, you know, a hundred dollars and get the lawyer to go over the contract. And you can re renegotiate it. Not all the contracts are the same um, because I heard hor so many horror stories. So you have them look over the contract and then towards the end of uh, my experience with the one individual publisher, um, I had to do a severance contract. And even though he's a sweetheart, bless his heart, did the best that he could, the publisher, um, we drew up a, a severance you know, contract and I took that to a lawyer and paid the, the $150 and they went over it to make sure that even though they're really good people, the publisher was a really nice person, no fault of his own, shit went down and I was like, I gotta get out, I gotta get out. We kept it all legal. We kept it all between lawyers. We had to make sure that, that just because he was a nice person and just because I was a nice person didn't necessarily mean that we things weren't gonna go badly legally. Yeah. I think the other thing is sometimes, especially with smaller publishers, they may have downloaded a boilerplate contract from somewhere mm -hmm. and it may have terrible terms in it. They didn't write that because they're terrible people. They just got this from, you know, rentacontract.com or whatever. Uh, but you need to protect yourself and go in and say, no, I'm not agreeing to these terms. And if we can't agree to take these terms out, then I guess we can't do business together. So it isn't always that those terms are in there because they're terrible, awful people. They may have just copied a contract from somewhere else where they were terrible, awful people. Or well, because I the contracts are structured for the house, not for the author, because it's still a business investment. And like they've all said, you can negotiate anything, just about. I'm a member of the Authors Guild in New York City, and I was with a terrible company one time, one of my books. They were awful, and Authors Guild has a legal department that helped me get out. So it is worth $100 a year or whatever they ask you to, to pay just to have that legal background when you need it. Well, and that is something else that an agent does for you is when you have any kind of a disagreement with a publisher, you can play good cop, bad cop mm -hmm. through your agent. So the, the agent can go and say, hey, guys, come on, you know, what are you doing this for? Or, you know, we're really concerned about this. And they can push on the publisher. You get to sit back and be the nice person, the smiley person, so the, the publisher doesn't get mad at you. And yet you're still getting what you want. Well, it isn't that you're undercutting the, the agent. It's just you don't have to be the person in their face saying, no, we don't want to do it this way. And besides that, a good agent knows what the uh, what's being done elsewhere in publishing, what other authors are doing or not doing, so they have the leverage to go, come on, really? You know nobody else is doing that. Why are you pulling this crap? In this case, the Authors Guild had a file on this publisher, and they were getting ready to go to the DA from that state. So it was really a good experience, even though it started off awful. Oh, the learning experiences of, oh, I have a new rule in my contract. If I give you a book to publish, you have to publish it within, like, a year or two. Because <laughs> three years is a little long for when's the next book coming out, huh? <laughs> 
a good tool to use, especially for, for writers who are just starting out and don't have a real big budget to spend is Legal Zoom. Mm -hmm. yeah. um, it's like, uh, I don't know, it's like $25 a month or something like that, but you get a copyright every month. Sorry? 29 29 a month you get uh, a copyright every month you get access to a lawyer to look over your contracts I mean it's a really good uh, tool to use um, this might be a little bit personal but what approximate percentage of sales do you spend on marketing and advertising as little as possible. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I, I try when when I when I do marketing, I try um, to do a lot of stuff myself because it just it just saves money. I mean, I'm not Stephen King. I don't, ro you know, I'm not drowning in royalties. <laughs> um, my checks don't have a whole lot of zeros on them. So I try and do a lot of stuff myself. Mm -hmm. I will. I have been known to crochet penises as swag, okay? Um, but you know what? I, I get a lot of readers that way. You would be surprised <laughs> how many people seem to want one. <laughs> um, so yes, yeah, so I do as much as, as possible myself. Um, I shop around <laughs> for swag um, and get to get the best possible price. Don't you do garage sale stuff too? Um, I will, yeah, I will hit garage sales and find shit. I have found that if you <coughs> could stick a sticker on it or a ribbon on it, it's swag. Yeah. So <laughs> I will hit, I will hit garage sales and outlet, try and find stuff. Outlet stores are mm -hmm. a godsend and stores. dollar stores too. But mm -hmm. you can find sometimes cheaper than a dollar. It's My the favorite place is Five Below. Yeah. I go cheaper than that, baby. We have to talk. But, um, no, I mean for like um, gift basket stuff. For gift baskets, yeah. even this. Yeah. I got these. Aren't these cute? I put a little tag on it. It has my website and information about it, a little cute poem. And it comes in a little silk thing. I got 200 of these for about $60. And it only took me like a dollar to get a, the 200 of these tags at Walmart and then to run off the stickers. Small things like that, you would be surprised what people remember. I do hair chopsticks too, you know, hair sticks and things like that. But I actually had a lady who I gave a fan like this to seven years ago. She still has it. At every book signing, she still has it and it still has my name on it. So she flutters it around like, she gave me this, this is amazing, this is awesome. I'm like, okay, we must do this again. Same thing that, you know, outlet, outlet shopping. Don't go for retail, go for wholesale. Mm -hmm. Find things on the penny, things that are remember that are memorable. And people will re if they even if they don't buy your book, they'll say, Hold oh, that that author, Stephanie Burke, you know, you know, not the politician one or the lawyer one, but the author, she gave me this fan. Traffic and mm -hmm. yeah. yeah, word of mouth is amazing. You want no. to encourage as much word of mouth as you can get. But no just lie, about three years ago, four years ago, I went to a convention um, in Florida, and I had found these little tiny <laughs> monkeys that had penises. And when you put them in water and you squeeze their heads, it would suck in the water, and then when you squeeze them, they would pee. And I put a ribbon on them, and I used that as my swag. And to this day, I still have people coming up to me and saying, oh, you're the, I know you, you're Kieran and Kelly, you're the one who gave out the peeing monkeys. So <laughs> while you may not be want, you know, want to be known as the person who gave out the peeing monkeys, they're remembering my name, and that's what counts. It's the peeing monkey lady. <laughs> so. It's five o'clock, folks. Yeah. <laughs> I want to, um, can we get a round of applause for these folks? <laughs> now one round of applause, a ginormous round of applause for you folks for coming out on a fucking Sunday. As always, my man Scott. And thank you to Sasha for moderating. Yes. Yeah. I'm sure you can find us around. I'm in the artist alley, pop and comic artist alley. I'm in the vendor room, 1223. I'm wandering. Trust me, you can't miss me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm smoking cigars. Yeah, I'm hired, so.